Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I think one of the best things that we can do while we wait for our Lord to return is rest in Psalm 23. It's always been a favorite chapter of mine. It's very popular among Christians. It's, it's uh, think of how many people that that Psalm has blessed over the generations, over the years, the centuries. You know, and now here we are. And I thought it would just be a great idea if we just took a look at it. So I'm going to go through Psalm 23. I'm going to kind of give you some of my thoughts on it. Uh, I'm probably going to try to look a little deeper beneath the surface, look at the Hebrew, uh, uh, try to piece this together in a way that I think will honor our Lord. And so let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So grateful that we have that access. So blessed to know that you love us and that you care for us. You lead us, guide us, direct us. You, you are uh, our God. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not of you. Just seal to our hearts that which is true. That we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I guess uh, most of you are aware of the fact that David wrote it. Uh, he was a shepherd. And uh, it just seems kind of interesting to me. You know, that, you know it's, it, it may seem like a simple thing. A more really obvious thing on the surface, you know. I mean, David was a shepherd, and we're reading him, him say, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Lord is my shepherd. You know, it would be kind of like, uh, you know, if, if, if the Lord had been a tent maker, you know, Paul, you know, imagine Paul saying, you know, uh, the Lord is my tent maker. Now, it was something that David was very familiar with, obviously, and the first thing that I'm reading when I pick this up and I read this is the Lord is my shepherd. I think uh, I may have mentioned once or twice in, in, in all the videos that I've done, it's been quite a few, hundreds, that it's probably a good idea if we slow down and if we stop and think about the just exactly what it is we're reading and try and make more sense of it than we would if we just sort of skimmed across the surface and we didn't spend any time at all meditating on his word thinking about it trying to rationalize it in light of all the rest of scripture try to make it fit in harmony with all of the rest of scripture what we call the analogy of scripture where nothing contradicts anything else the first thing I read is, He's my shepherd. It doesn't say that He might be my shepherd. It'd be nice if, you know, if He was my shepherd. It says He is. And so the first thing in my mind, it may not, may not occur in yours, but the first thing in my mind is I'm suddenly jolted with the reality that I didn't make Him my shepherd. Now, of course, I understand how that argument can go the other way. Well, if we accept Him, then He becomes our shepherd. You're looking at a... First, first of all, you're already looking at a sheep. You're already looking at one of His, God's elect. Uh, I've done enough videos on election, divine election, and, and our being chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world uh, that... I don't want to spend all that time in in this particular. I mean, there's only six verses here in Psalm 23, but I don't want to spend all that time talking about election. I want to actually try to, to, to gain from these six verses a clearer picture of just who we are, who God is, and what He's doing in our life. And the first thing that I have to, I'm forced to notice is that He's my shepherd. And I know that I didn't make him that. I shall not want. 
if you look at the Hebrew word, if, and we're going to look at a number of these Hebrew words, but if you look at the word, there's nothing lacking. I shall not lack. I mean, uh, we read the Apostle Paul saying that we come behind in no grace, that we're not lacking in any spiritual grace. And that perfectly harmonizes with the text here. But the, the first thing is that I shall not want. That means that I'm to be content in all circumstances. To, I'm to understand He's the shepherd. And he's guiding me, leading me, directing me, feeding me. What is there? Well, okay, well, let's see. Now, wait a minute. Uh, what do I want? I shall not want. Oh, does that mean that I can't want a new pickup? Or does that mean I can't want a, a wife or, or a husband? Or does that mean that I can't want a house? Or What do you mean I, I shall not want? So what, in whatever circumstances I happen to be in, I am to be there with, by, by that much, I'm to be content. If, if, you, uh, if you have a house, if you don't have a house, if you have a, a spouse, if you don't have a spouse, if you, if you have a job, if you don't have a job, I think, I think what verse 1 of Psalms 23, I think the message that, that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey here, or is, is conveying here, first of all, is that we didn't make him shepherd and that our every need is met. And when I say every need, well, you can, you can I'm, I'm sure, you know, many of you could argue, well, it sure doesn't seem like many of my physical needs are being met. In fact, it doesn't even really feel like all my spiritual needs are, are being met. So how can that be the case? Uh, I shall not want. I shall not want a new Bible. I shall not want to... Uh, to find a good church to go to. I shall not want a, a, a fellowship that I can feel comfortable in. What, Dearly beloved, I'm trying to quite simply explain what I believe I shall not want means. And what I believe I shall not want means is I shall not want. It doesn't matter whether, whether we're talking about a physical need, a spiritual need, but to realize all of my needs are met in Christ. It's really what the first verse is saying. It, st it starts out with that in this psalm. And I just wonder how many Christians today actually believe that what, what, how many of them apply that, that verse 1 to their actual day-to-day -day life. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, when you say it really fast, maybe by saying it really fast, we kind of get the idea of better of, of just what that is saying. Folks, He desires that we trust Him in all things. All things. What, what is physical, spiritual? Now, I think this context is primarily a... We're looking at a theological, a, a, a an ecclesiastical sort of a context. We're looking at, but but I will also, I, I'm not going to argue with anybody that this is not our life, our 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 soul life, our 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 person, you know who we are, and we see that actually in the Hebrew when when we take the time to look. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Now, wait a minute. I thought, okay, let's see. I've got a shepherd, we're the sheep. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Just about every picture that you would Google, or, you know, if you just walk out into the country, you know, some, you're going to see sheep and they're going to be grazing. And sometimes they'll be lying down. But I think the idea is much that, that we're seeing here is much more than just the fact that, well, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. In other words, it's just great. It's really great. It's an awesome thing. It's to be grazing on the Word of God. You know, we, we are we are just we're sheep. We're eating. We're eating all the time, and we are. We're we're feasting on Him. Okay, we're we get together and we feast on Christ in the Word. But it says He maketh me first of all. It's. He, and, and I have to stop and ask myself, now, wait a minute, 
am I to read these six verses and place Christians in two categories, the haves and the have-nots? Am I to read these six verses and am I to separate, divide Christians into those who are spiritual and those who are not? Am I to read these six verses and am I to divide Christians into two groups, those in which these six verses are describing and those in which they're not? That was a tough question for me. I mean, it's, are we looking at the ideal here Christian life. This is the ideal walk. Okay, well, because Steve, he's surely, he's not making me lie down in green pastures. He may be leading you uh, beside the, uh, in the paths of righteousness. He may be leading you beside the still waters. He may be restoring your soul, but he sure ain't doing that in mine. And, folks, I can only tell you what I believe. And what I believe strongly. For what it's worth, and, and and you know, again, this is just my opinion. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm I'm no guru uh, of, you know, I don't have a handle on on truth. I'm no oracle of truth, but I can tell you that in my heart, soul, spirit, mind, everything, I think this is true of every single Christian, not only alive today, but who's ever lived from Adam all the way to the end of time. I think we're describing something that is true, that the Holy Spirit is writing something. This is in saying, this is the fact, this is true. This is not what I this is not the ideal picture I'm trying to paint for you here. This is not what I really would desire if you would just do something. Something, anything, whatever you wanna whatever you wanna tack onto that list or of things. It's 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 I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking that way here at all. I think he's saying is what is true of, of me is true of you, and vice versa. He's, he's my shepherd. I didn't make him my shepherd. I'm not lacking anything. I'm not coming behind in any spiritual grace. He makes me. I don't lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down. Now, now wait a minute. I, I thought we were supposed to be up on our, on our, on our four hook feet here grazing you know, what, what are we doing lying down? I find it enormously fascinating when, when you go through the Hebrew and you see just how many words are used in conjunction with or are in connection with or with the, the reality of rest that's, that's associated with the pit, that's built into the overall picture, okay? It's... He makes me to rest in green pastures. Now, we've translated it green. The word is grass in the Hebrew. The word is just grass. And that's what sheep feed on, which is con consistent then with the picture of us feasting on, on Him in the Word. He leads us into the Word. He, he makes us to lie down in green pastures. Now, if anything, what that says to me is, is it's not, it's, I guess the simplest way I can put this is he's not saying he makes me to eat in green pastures. That's not what it said. Uh, he makes me to graze, he maketh me to graze in green pastures. That ain't what it says. This, this is what I mean about slowing down and, and stopping and thinking about these verses and, and really looking at the words and, and sort of toe-stepping it gently through these verses, not blowing past them so quick that, we, that we, we miss much of the richness that's in it. He makes me. He makes me. He's the active agent, the outside cause. I don't make myself rest in His Word. I don't make myself rest in His Word, but He does. And in the Christian's life, there's no other option. He has made the weakest Christian, He has made them to rest in His Word. He's made them rest in His Word. Why? Because there's, that's their source of nourishment. That's their source. 
That's how they're sustained, nourished, built up. There is no other option. There is no other place. There is no other thing. That's all there is. And you can't tell, you are not going to con ever convince me that God has uh, one of his children over here that he's just doesn't, he's too busy, doesn't have time to be involved with. If this is not true of you, it's not true of me. He makes us to lie down, rest in grass. And it's a pleasant place. The, the Hebrew word has the, carries with it, conveys the idea of something pleasant. And he leadeth me beside. Now, that's been a, been a many an argument I, over that word beside. Many of the translations, you know, it's over, it's, over, it's beside, it's, uh, I think it's even under. Uh, it depends on how you look at that Hebrew word, but he leadeth me, if we just look at it simply, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He leadeth me beside it. Now, I want you to take note of something here, if you, if you would, in verse 2. Please, if you don't do anything else, take note of the fact that it doesn't say he maketh me to eat in green pastures. Notice that it doesn't say he maketh me to drink of the still waters. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. And I think that is also something that is at least significant enough to stop and think about that he, he doesn't force us to study to show ourselves approved a workman that needeth not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth he doesn't force you to he doesn't force feed you as as you as you well he but he paid but he puts you there he puts you in that environment and we have been put in an environment that is Rich in green in green pasture, his word led beside the still waters. Verse three, he restoreth my soul. And that word soul is the complete person. Everything about you. Uh, some people say, well, soul, you know, that means it's the seed of human emotions. It's the it's sort of the you know the intimate sort of a, you know. Uh, I guess what you'd say, uh, intimate sort of emotional part of you. It's 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 more a, a kind of a of, of a of a right main brain sort of a thing. It's not the left brain, cognitive, rational, serious. You know, all serious all the time. He restoreth my soul. Everything about me. Now, when you look at the word restoreth. It's it's a, it's a very interesting word in the Hebrew. You can easily, if you you know use Bible Hub like I do, you you can easily go uh, to the interlinear and you can look at that, and you and it'll give you the definition of of that word. Restores. That Hebrew word is to turn back, to return. It's it almost seems like repentance. Uh, I I wouldn't limit it it to that uh he repents my soul you know it's it's uh but it, it does mean to the literal definition is to turn back to return and that's what he does to everything about me this is what he does oh well steve gosh that's so cool but gosh and i just wish that was true of me I mean, you know, it's it's nice that that's true of you, and and uh, man, it, it's just uh, he, you know, he renews your strength. Uh, you know, he restores your soul. He uh, uh, he refreshes you. He renews you. He uh, whatever he brings you back. He's you know he's brought refreshes your life, converts your soul. Uh, you know, whatever translation that you want to you know bring into that picture there. It, 
wonderful. I mean, truly, I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I really mean it. I'm, I'm happy for you. Just that, he ain't restoring my soul. Dearly beloved, if he's not restoring your soul, then he's not your shepherd. I, I have a very difficult time, folks. I, I truly do, and I, I, you know, and I don't mean to. Some people think I try to overcomplicate things. I'm not trying to over overcomplicate anything. It's just the Lord is, says David, who was a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Beautiful, beautiful language. It's 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 like poetry, almost. I shall not want. I'm not lacking in anything. He's taking care of my every need, and he he makes me to rest in his word, and he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul, and you're going to tell me that he's restoring this guy's soul, but not this guy's soul. He, you're going to tell me he's, he's restoring this, this brother's soul, but not this sister's soul. You know, he, he, you're going to tell me that he's, re, he's <coughs> excuse me, but he's, he's just going to pick who's, who he wants to restore their soul and uh, their soul, and he'll do that, and he won't do that in the case of others. I, you would be hard-pressed to find any, any verse, okay, that says that our Heavenly Father plays uh, is partial towards his children well Steve I just don't man I just you know all this this is really wonderful you say but you know he's just not restoring my soul he says he is I, I you can sit around and argue all day that he's not that he's not he's not making you to lie down in green pastures he's not leading you beside the still waters he's you know that but in verse one, we were the God dropped the bombshell here that we shall not want. I don't know, maybe maybe a thousand Christians. If you got together a thousand Christians and they uh, you gave them Psalm twenty three and you told them to write an expository verse by verse, you know, anal you know, exposition of it. You know, you'd probably get a thousand different interpretations. Maybe, maybe that's true. But folks, I don't see anything as beautiful and as simple as this. I don't. I think that sometimes what we do is we make things more complicated than than what they really are. And and a lot of the times that we do that because we've we have such short memories. You know, we we. We'll, we'll come to change our position on what we formerly believed about something when we come to see something we adopt such and such you know fact you know as as truth it's like okay we're gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna incorporate that into my theology but if it doesn't if it if it con if, if there's something else that I formerly believed that contradicts that well that's got to go you know listen to me dearly beloved it's precept upon precept. As long as we go through the Word and we don't contradict the whole, I think we're fine. I think we're okay. And there's, there's enough validation to say that, that what we're looking at in Psalms 23 is really little more, and I have to put that in quotes. It's, it's, it's a lot greater than that. It's, 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 but there's a simplicity to it. And I think what we're looking at in Psalm 23 is well big shock i mean it's our life okay it's well okay it's, it's not exactly a bombshell i mean you know it's it's our life but i don't think that we can go around saying well this is my psalm 23 that's my life hey is psalm 23 your life if it's not you better make it your life folks it's it's your life or it's not he does restore your soul he does lead you in the paths of righteousness he has to do that. He, what else can he do? I don't think that that phrase "leading me in the paths of righteousness" uh, could could be in any way uh, interpreted as to be saying that he, you know, he leads us, you know, into the well. He leads leads us through the Ten Commandments. 
There he leads us through, you know, the law, righteousness, personal righteousness, achieved on a personal level. You know, we just, you know, we got to do the best we can. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. It's, he's, he's leading me to do the best I can. Doesn't say that. The righteousness. Whose righteousness? Well, all we know all ours are is filthy rags. We know it's going to be talking about His righteousness, and it's for His name's sake. His name's sake. Now, this is what He does. And again, you argue, and say, oh, Steve, my gosh, that's, surely that can't be true of me. You know, I'm, it's lovely that it's true of you. It's, I'm so happy for you. You know, I mean, really, you know, it's... it's I'm really glad that's true of you, but it just can't possibly be true of me. He doesn't lead me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest to you that if he's not leading you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, if that's not the, word, the direction he's leading you, he's not your shepherd. It's just that simple. And, and I don't think that, that any one of us should come here, come to this text and say, okay, well, you know, that, that, that doesn't, that seems to fit you, and then that seems to fit me, and, and uh, I don't see either one of us here in this, this part, and, you know, but, and here, here we seem to both be together here on this part, and, you know, we just, we just, we just tear it apart. <laughs> be gentle with it. <laughs> don't rip it apart. We walk, verse 4, though I walk, which I do. And I do, you do, we all do. Through the valley of the shadow of death, of dark, of death's darkness, is literally what the Hebrew reads. We walk through a valley, a low place, we, you know, with and normally a valley has rising, you know, the, the sides, the mountains, you know, the, along both sides of it. You're not going to get out of it. <laughs> You're not going to get out of, out of the walk that God designed, deigned, and, and ordained, you know, for you. And this walk that we're in is, is, is called the valley of the shadow of death. Now, I am not opposed at all to this being a eulogy. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's. I heard it quoted on the uh, by the the preacher, some preacher, on the Titanic as it was seen in the movie Titanic as it was sinking. You know, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and he's holding on, he's holding on to to keep. You know, he's got people. He's holding on to them, and he's holding on to the ship. He's, you know. I'm not opposed to that at all. But what I would suggest here is that this is more than just a eulogy. This is talking about, it's, not, it's certainly not saying that, that I'm someday going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say that. Though I walk, I presently am walking right now. You, I, you are, I am, through this low place of the darkness of death. This world is not our home. Now I could stop there. I could preach a whole lot on that valley of the shadow of death, but you know, all I, the only point I really want to make in this video is is that whereas most Christians that I've met just take that as to mean, well, that's referring to you know uh, our passing. I don't think it's referring to our passing at all. I don't think it's referring to our demise, our, our physical death at all. The grammar doesn't allow it. The context doesn't se seem to support it. it. I'm walking through this place. that is It is a dark place. And in, the, in this walk through this, I will fear no evil. I'll fear no evil. And maybe you'll okay, get once again, okay, one of you out there is going to say, well, Steve, yeah, all right. I'm glad you don't fear evil. I do. I...
And again, I'm going to suggest, <laughs> I want to suggest that this is true of every single one of his sheep. As we walk through this place, we'll fear, we fear no evil. We fear no evil. If you are a born-again child of God who's been regenerated, born again by God from above, given new life, baptized into the body of Christ, given a new mind, a new nature, which can't sin, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, you have nothing to fear. The, te the verse is saying you have nothing to fear when it comes to evil. And what is evil? Well, evil is everything, everything and anything that opposes the will and work of God in your life. And you don't fear that. You don't fear that. Now, you know, uh, well, Steve, you know, uh, does, is, does someone chasing you with an axe, you know, uh, or, or pointing a shotgun in, in your face, is that, is that evil? I, I mean, I, I fear that, you know, it's, and folks, I just don't think that's what it's talking about. In our walk with the Lord, in this body, through this world, we are, for the most part, involved in activities, whether we like it or not. God's perspective of our lives here is one that I would say, I guess the best way I could put it is, uh, I'd say, I'd suggest that it's his, the picture of, that God has of us here. It has very little to do with, with someone chasing us with an axe or putting a shotgun in our face. You know, or, you know, anything that we would typically classify as evil, and, and we can go, that's a long list of stuff. It's that, that con this context screams out that this evil here has to do with our life, our message, our ministry, and whatever opposition comes against us as a result of that. That's how I read that. Uh, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. How could I can see where the staff would comfort me? The staff, you know, but the rod? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Boy, does he do that. Thou anointest my head with oil. Boy, does he do that. And my cup runneth over. Boy, does it do that. You know, why, why would my cup runneth over? Because there's nothing I, in this picture of our lives that we're looking at here, there's nothing to be seen other than that which is which is praiseworthy in my in my opinion it's everything is praiseworthy uh, if you look at this very very closely it begins with the, the the Lord is my shepherd and it ends with I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever that's pretty cool in my opinion you know it's it's that's why it, it seems as if this is that's those are bookends and then everything in the middle of those bookends is our life and of course, that, that shouldn't be too shocking. I mean, you know, okay, all right, so Psalm 23 is our life. Well, I'm, yeah, what's the big bombshell there? Well, I think the big bombshell there is that we can, will continue, Christians continue to go to, to, to look at Psalms 23 and go, well, that, that's, that's really wonderful. Uh, wish, wish that was my life. The Lord is your shepherd. If the Lord is your shepherd, you'll dwell in the, in the house of the Lord forever. So there's a, there's eternal security right there. It's you know we can you, we can explore a million avenues of discussion you know on the matter of, of doctrinal you know biblical eternal security. 
But there's just a plain statement from the Lord right there that it's not, there is nothing in the text at all to indicate uncertainty. Nothing. Surely, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Really. Uh, just recently I've met Christians that, that goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life. Are you, got, are you kidding me, Steve? I mean, can't possibly be. So, again, we're forced to look at what, what, what this goodness and mercy is. If we, if we look at goodness as, well, you know, God, God's, you know, if He really loved me, He'd give me this, that, or the other thing. And if that's what goodness is to you, then I, I, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. If you look at goodness, you know, as everything that He gives you is good, even what appears to be bad is good, then it all makes sense. Goodness and mercy shall follow me. And mercy, we, of course, most Christians understand that mercy is basically the opposite of grace, whereas grace is undeserved favor. You know, uh, mercy is the opposite. It's uh, We receive God's grace. We receive what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And so this is what follows me all the days of my life. All the days of my life. It follows me. And notice that it doesn't say goodness and mercy. I want, you, I want you to follow good and mercy all the days of your life. And folks, I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm just... It doesn't say that. It, it says that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever well look i love you all i truly do if you're interested in second corinthians we're in chapter six meet us there on sunday until then until next time this is steve thanks for watching